We can please call the meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. Uh, we don't have any audio. Microphones are not working tonight, so I'm going to yell as loud as I can. Um, I'll do my best. So if you wouldn't mind standing for the Pledge of Allegiance by myself, and yeah, remain standing for the invocation by Director Slauson. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, thank you for our lives, our loved ones, um, our wonderful military and police. And please give us the wisdom and strength to make the right decisions for our communities tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Director Slauson. Um, let's go ahead and start with the roll call, please. Director Slauson? Here. Director Hoffman? Present. President Covington? Present. Director Williams? Here. The Director of America. Thank you. I'm going to keep reaching for that mic, so I'm going to move it out of the way. Okay, we do have uh, two public comment speakers uh, tonight. I'm going to go ahead and read before we get started at this time. Any person may address the Board of Directors on matters within its jurisdiction which are not on the agenda. However, state law prohibits the Board from discussing or taking action on any item not listed on the agenda. Any non-agenda matters that require action will be referred to staff for a report and possible action at a subsequent meeting. To provide comments on a specific agenda item, please complete a speaker's request form and provide the completed form to the board secretary prior to the board meeting. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Sharing or passing time to another speaker is not permitted. In the absence of Director Ramirez tonight as the board secretary, I turn those over to uh, Vice President Slauson. So let's go ahead and start. Yes, Mr. President. We have two speakers. First will be Patsy Reilly. <coughs> Speak loud. You can't hear a darn thing. You might as well go home. Uh, I understand there's no contract between BCWD and the city of uh, Beaumont regarding recycled water. Go back and read the 1995 contract. Review it. It says rate payers do not pay for the recycled water. This was part of the deal with the city back then. We still have no recycled water plant, no money to pay for one. Somehow the money disappears. Please solve this and let's move on. Thank you, Patsy. Next. Next we have Judy Bingham. <clears throat> Judy Bingham, 1440 East 6th Street. For 20 years we watched the unholy alliance between the city and Chuck Butcher. Beaumont Cherry Valley Water District let Butcher off with a slap on the wrist and the DA didn't indict the corrupt city council. So here we go again. Nothing has changed. For 20 years, Water District allowed unlimited will-serve letters and drained Beaumont Basin. <coughs> A contract said the Water District would get recycled water at no charge. Now, in last night's two-by-two -two meeting, it became obvious the city is charging the water district for recycled water. The regional board says the city finally has to produce recycled water after all these years. Now, why do ratepayers have to pay for the same water three times? Could someone explain that to me? Parton said last night that the city has no wastewater master plan. But the water district has a $3 million plan. Parton also said the MOU was to be sure the water district and the city were on the same sheet of music. Well, what I see is more dirty dancing and as usual, the ratepayers will be the ones that suffer. It, became, it has become painfully obvious why Eric Frazier had to go. And we know the ones that masterminded it. 
Okay, any other public comment? No. Hearing none, let's move on to the uh, action items. Action item number one, adjustments to the agenda. Any adjustments? We, we have um, some people in the audience. Our, our PR firm is in the audience, and so I was thinking maybe they're the uh, last item, item number 11. So I was thinking maybe we should move up item number 11, and while we're at it, maybe move up item number 9 towards a higher position, just to get through those two, since there's some people in the audience that believe are interested in item number 9 also. Um, if that's acceptable to the board, I'd like to reorder 9 and 11 farther up the line. And take it in order of 9 first and 11 second. Okay. However, one final note is as we reorder, we're waiting for some printouts since our PowerPoint isn't done. And so we're printing out some things that will be coming in. And item 9 will. Um, let, let me know when, item, in, when those come we'll in and then we'll, order, that's okay. we'll get them. We'll slip them into the queue. Okay. Okay, so until then, we'll follow uh, the agenda as it's, uh, as it's ordered. Um, let's move on to item number two, consent calendar, items A through G. Is there a motion to approve or to remove and hereby uh, later discussion any, any uh, items that are within the consent calendar? I move that we uh, approve the consent calendar as uh, listed. Second. We have a motion by Director Hoffman and a second <laughs> by Director Slauson to approve the consent calendars, items A through G. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And all opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 4-0. All right. Let's move on to uh, item number three, consideration of resolution 2019, authorizing submission of an application requesting live scan services, consideration of appointment of the Director of Finance and Administrative Services to the role of custodian of records and appointment of the general manager as an alternate in rescinding previous resolution 2018-12. This is located on page 48 of the board agenda. We'll turn this over to staff, please. Certainly, thank you, Yolanda Rodriguez, is prepared to talk about this. Um, so, Yolanda. Okay, so we're bringing back resolution 2018-2, um, which we brought back in, um, I believe it was in September 12, 2018. The reason why we're asking to resend it is because the language on resolution 2018. There's a paragraph, the last paragraph talks about licensing and certification. It says the district is not an entity that does that, uh, mm -hmm. that that's licensing and um, certification. We have to remove that for the recommendation of the Department of Justice. So that is why we, resend, we are sending uh, resolution 2018-2 with 2019. I'm not sure which is the number next. Time. Okay. Anything else? Hearing none, we'll open up for discussion by the board. Director Williams? Nothing. Director Hoffman? No comment. And Director Slauson? Seems straightforward, no comment. The only, the only thing I noticed, uh, Yolanda, in two of the paragraphs, two of the whereas, or one of the whereas, and then the last word, now there be a result where the licensing or certification purposes have been stricken from the the uh, modified 2019 agenda, which is what you alluded to. Uh, I didn't see any other changes. Does that sound about correct? That's the only Because I, I don't see a red line version, so I just kind of compared the two. Yeah, that, I'm sorry about that. That's the only part. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to approve resolution 2019? Excuse me. Authorized submission of an application requesting live scan services, consideration of Appointment of the Director of Finance and Administrative Services to the role of custodian of records and appointment of the general manager as an ultimate. So moved. I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion by Director Slauson, a second by Director Hoffman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 4 0. And that motion should also include rescinding resolution 2018 2. I forgot to include That's that. Right. Okay, 
Um, item number four, <coughs> consideration of a resolution authorizing the general manager to submit an application to the Bureau of Reclamation for a water smart, water and energy efficient grant located on page 53. Let's turn it over to staff, please. Certainly, what, what we have here is, is a housekeeping item. We're going to make a grant application for um, AMR, AMI, and we have to have a resolution that supports that from the board level. And so this is uh, that, the housekeeping item to make that happen. Um, and I'll stop there unless there's questions. But AMR, AMI, automatic meter read, automatic meter um, infrastructure. And so we currently have a capital improvement program to do that work. Um, but it would require a little bit more work if we were to get the grant. We would look at the AMI portion, which is uh, automatic collector. It's another $150,000 or so. But if we got a grant to support that, it would actually make us a more um, robust activity in our metering of, of the district, I guess. But we'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Certainly. Um, Dan, a couple of questions. One, do you have a, even a general idea of how many meters we have out there that are not automated yet? Um, I think, you know, we have 18,000 meters so far. A lot of the newer, newer meters recently have been installed with the meter application, so there's probably 1,500 or so there. And we've been doing about 200 a month over the last 8 months or 12 months. So when it's all said and done, you know, it's probably somewhere on the order of uh, 2,500 or 3,000 that are automatically read now. Completed. And okay. then the 18,000 minus, that's the rest of it. I think it was 15,000 is what we were targeting. And so probably it's 14,000 or so. And did I read in here somewhere? And I'm looking for it, so I apologize. Do we have approximately after a grant, <coughs> should we receive the grant funding, which again is 50% fifty percent match, correct? So that's what we're asking for. And then, uh, it's up to a million and a half dollars, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Oh, okay. Doesn't mean we'll get it all. But uh, I think we think we have a little over $3 million worth of expenditures left to go. Mm -hmm. And so by the time... It all works out. If we were to get the million and a half, we would be a match. If we got something less, it would be whatever it would be, and um, we would work for Sure. It. Sure, we'll take anything we can get. Do, right. do you have three years to implement? Is that what I read somewhere? Yeah, I believe, I believe it's a three-year project, and what we're doing is we're giving them a schedule that meets the project line, and our hope would be to do it a little bit faster okay. if we were to get the matching grant. Okay. All right, let's open it up for further discussion. Director Williams? Anything? Director Hoffman. Just a question to, each, uh, to the staff. How do you, based on the uh, research that's been done so far and the, I'm assuming, application process, do you feel that we are a possible fit and eligible for grant funds based on what you have observed so far? So the Yucaipa Valley Water District in Banning applied last year. Yucaipa Valley Water District did receive a grant, as I understand it. Banning did not. My understanding is they may have um, put their application in the wrong column of what they were asking for, and so they're going to apply again this year also, and their hope is to get it. And so, you know, that's 50, that's bad even 500, I guess. And so um, we've got the help of grant writers that hopefully would be a little more successful. And do you, do you feel, how, do, do we have any idea how long the uh, grant process takes and, and approval process? And assuming it's less than a year because they already got denied apparently last year. Yeah, yeah, it happens fairly fast. I don't have off the top of my head the specific schedule, but, uh, you know, it's probably the next three months or so that it kind of works its way through. And if we receive the grant, uh, maybe haven't checked this out yet, but are there certain conditions that we have to comply with afterwards as far as uh, meeting certain uh, goals and so forth and reporting and so forth? Yeah, you have reporting activities. You have to, <coughs> pardon me, you have to uh, get it done in the time allotted and do what you say you're going to do. Okay. Thank you. Director Slauson. All right. Do we have a motion? to approve Resolution 2019 authorizing the General Manager to submit an application to the Bureau of Reclamation for Water Smart Water and Energy Efficiency Grant. So moved. I'll second it. Motion by Director Williams, a second by Director Hoffman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 4-0. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to item number five. 
consideration of resolution 2019 concurring in nominations to the executive committee of the association of california water agencies joint powers insurance authority aqua gpa located on page 57 of the agenda certainly i think yolanda rodriguez will speak to this one so, uh, former Shared Valley Water District is a member of the Aqua JPIA Joint Powers Authority of the Water Agencies. And uh, currently there are four seats. Uh, there are two vacancies out of four that are vacant. The Yuba, Studi Yuba City Water, uh, County Water Agency nominee Brent Hasty is asking for nomination from uh, our district. So is Western Municipal Water District nominee A. 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 Lopez or Al Lopez is asking for our nomination. So we have the option either to adopt one, adopt both, or adopt none for the concurrent and the nomination of both. <coughs> so we have four seats in Aqua JPIA, two are vacant. They're asking for our nomination. The two vacancies? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> okay. And so, Yolanda, I read in here, there's a certain criteria where the agency, the agency has to meet before they can um, submit nominations. And I'm just gonna make the assumption that Beaumont Cherry Valley didn't meet like all those four criterias. Yes. Right, because it's open, we're members of Aqua JPA, JPA. Right. So, <clears throat> in essence, if we would, if this agency was to meet those, that criteria, they could in, in itself nominate their own directors. Cannot. No, I mean, or we could out. We could put out nominations, right? Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So um, let's open it up for questions, Director Williams. Okay. So since I'm new, you were just saying that we can nominate or we cannot. We what 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 we've been asked to do? We we the district has received information so regarding the right. two candidates. <clears throat> we have the option to uh, nominate. Beaumont Cherry Valley Water District would nominate Mr. Hasty and Mr. Lopez, or one or the other, or both. We can, we can do both. Then. Absolutely. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Director Hoffman. So there's two vacancies and two nominees potential at this point mm -hmm. to fill those vacancies. Correct. That's correct. And, and okay, I understand <clears throat> what our options are then. Yeah. And that's all. So we have the option to. to um, nominate one or both. Um, so Mr. Lopez is local from Western Municipal Water District, got a long history from what I read in the staff report. Mr. hastley has been in uh, public government for a long time, so um, they both appear to be valid um, um, nominees. So, um, Director Slauson, any questions? Uh, no questions. I uh, would prefer, though, if our board were to uh, nominate both, at least, at least Mr. Lopez. Okay. okay, thank you. So, um, do we have a motion to nominate by resolution uh, Mr. Brent Hasty and Mr. Al Lopez to the Aqua JPIA Executive Committee? So moved. I'll second. We have a first by Director Slauson and a second by Director Williams mm -hmm. to nominate uh, Mr. Brent Hastley and Mr. Al Lopez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Okay. Item number six consideration of attendance at the Santa Ana River Watershed Conference Water Education Foundation at Cal State Fullerton on March 29, 2019, located on page 63. Um, Yolanda, do you, you want to feel this one? I'm sorry, Yolanda. <laughs> I was thinking of something else. Sorry about that. Um, this is related to, to attending the San Ana River Watershed Conference. I think we sent a notice out to the board at Cal State Fullerton on March 29th. Mm -hmm. 2019, it's located at 365, and I think the intent is to see if there's board interest in attending that conference. Um, and so, that being said, it's related to the Santa Ana River Watershed, which covers 
a significant area where at the top end of that watershed, so it's important for us to start participating and use that activity as a networking opportunity. If we're so inclined, we're asking for grants and things like that. So having a little more presence in that watershed is probably important at this point. The grants are being administered from the Santa Ana, Water, Santa Ana Project Watershed Authority, SAPA for short. And so um, getting our face out there in a way that as we're asking for money, we show up and participate is probably a good thing for the board and inclined to participate. Um, one thing, is that it? Uh, one, one item that I would like to point out if, if any of the directors have time is that the OWOW plan was updated and approved by the SAPA board in February, last month, February. And so uh, that plan has grown a lot based on the, the changing dynamics in, in the water world. So as you can see, that's going to be one of the topics on the agenda. California water plan, it's an annual, it's a five-year uh, annual water plan update. I've been around for a long time, I think since the 60s. And uh, some of the other items, which would be uh, integrated projects and then um, a big push under Prop 1 in, a, in order for them to get a large amount of Prop 1 was uh, disadvantaged communities and how those communities are going to be addressed and serviced. And so if you get a chance to read the OWOW update on their webpage, it's going to go through that uh, systematically. And there's just been a lot of changes to the OWOW plan, and it's actually... Um, very good. I, I read it, the majority of it. And so uh, I personally uh, would be in a tent, would want to go uh, for this one day event. So if there's any other directors that uh, wish to attend, uh, what say you? You don't have to go, of course. We're just, it needs to be agenda sized. So I asked Dan to put this on the agenda. On a normal uh, <coughs> circumstance, I would go, absolutely. I think it's very important, but that week I'm going to be out of town, out of state. Okay. okay. I could go. Okay. Director Williams, any interest? Yes, I'd be interested in going. Okay. Um, keep in mind, it's on a Friday, it's in Tustin. Yeah. Good luck coming home or getting down there. So, with that being said, uh, do we have a motion to approve Director Covington, Director Hoffman, and Director Williams to attend the 2019 Santa Ana River Watershed Conference? So moved. Second it. First by Director Slauson and a second by Director Hoffman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 4 0. Okay. You ready? Yeah, we're ready. Okay. So I'm probably just bringing, as I look at 9, 10, and 11 all up together, they sort of 9 and 10 run hand in hand. You ready? Yes, let's go ahead and bring up uh, item number nine on the agenda, update and discussion regarding California water conditions as of March 7th, 2019, located on page 95 of the board agenda. Or, no, or, stand down no. here in an effort to try to communicate a little better with the audience. Um, the first thing, which is item nine, <laughs> is just the current conditions of water in California. We're doing an update every meeting. That update is shown on this graphic, and effectively, we're in precipitation on the first page. We're uh, above average on all the watersheds that are of importance to the state water project, and uh, except for maybe the uh, San Joaquin Basin, where 39.6 and 40.2 is the basin, we're, we're above it on every other one. All the reservoirs in California are full, Above the historic average, Orville is at the historic average now. It came up very fast. San Luis Reservoir is currently beginning to release water as Article 21 water, as I understand it. Um, the past agency has 55 to 5,600 acre feet up there, and it's been converted to Article 21, 4,000 of it, I guess, and if you can't get it out, it, it goes away. Um, and so we work hard to get our recharge facilities online. The past is we made some temporary modifications to our East Prairie Extension Turnout. And uh, we're 
receiving water. We're online and receiving water. At 20 CFS, there's some hydraulic strains on the East Branch extension that are keeping the flows at 20 CFS, and our upgrade has not been completed, but parts of it have. So we'll be at 20 CFS for the month, month of March, and then when our upgrade is completed, we'll be able to try a higher flow. <laughs> When, did, when is the expected uh, um, date for that? I think it was supposed to be mid-March. I think it's moved back a little bit, early April, is my speculation based on what I'm seeing. We have a graphic of San Luis Reservoir, which shows it at the top flood stage. And we also have a graphic of Orville, which shows it at the historic average now, which is good, which is the blue kind of line. And so, so that's good for California. That's good for us. The next issue is the San Gorgonian Pass Water Agency is considering up, updating their rates, and they're looking in the direction I think of the board. Are we moving to item number ten? Yeah, sorry. For the record, so, yeah, item number me, ten. Actually, let me stop there. Are there any questions on item nine? I think we should start that first. So, is there any questions by the directors related to item number nine, Director Williams? No. Director Hoffman? No. And Director Slauson? Oroville sure did fill up fast. Correct. That's all. It, it happens fast when it's raining. <laughs> and we've had some good rains. Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to item number 10, discussion of San Gregorio Pass Water Agency 2019, Water Supply Outlook, Rate Study, Capacity Fee Study, Tax Base Funding, and San Gregorio Pass Water Agency, Schedule of Activities, and this is a handout uh, for the record that we are, of course, recording everything, so... We're trying to put, make sure everything gets into the record. So, thank you, Dan. Go ahead. Certainly. So what I what we have is a handout. It's two items. One is the past agency's agenda, with which I've incorporated in my PowerPoint, which we can't show because our system is down. But uh, it's a handout of what was provided at the Monday, March 11, 2019 engineering workshop, which was a discussion of rates, and the key takeaways are the past agency provided a graphic that showed rates, and I'll, I'll show it in the color in the slides, and there's printouts in the handout that printed out the three key slides, but um, it shows melted water rates over time, we looked at that stuff, seems a little high to us, but we've uh, worked through a lot of numbers, but effectively, when you look at the line, $250 an acre foot is that line right there. The current cost is about $250. It looks to me like it has a 2018. Every, every January, February, March, it comes out higher cost in the state water project, but by the end of the year, it, it reduces is what the data sets show. So then they talked about raising the rates. Well, they presented a graphic, which is this graphic. Mm -hmm. This graphic right here is also in the race, but what they showed is um, cost of water and income and expenses of what's collected through the rate is what this is. And really the takeaway, which I'll show in the PowerPoint, is at the bottom. So I'm going to leave that for a discussion in a minute. And then finally they looked at kind of what costs are and sales on the second to the last page, and they have water delivery options for this year, 10,000, 12, 5, 15, 17, 5, 20, and 22,500. We've ordered, all, the retailers have ordered, we've ordered 16,000 if we can get it. You've got the Valley Water District for 1,150 acre feet, and Banyan 250. That's 17,400 acre feet. When it's all said and done, and so, about the 17.5 line is where we hopefully will live this this fall. It's a wet year. It should be a good year. And so if you put so the bottom line shows if you if you put all the cost in including nickel, it costs you $467 an acre foot. If you don't put the nickel in with a base rate of 330, which I identified, the historic average has been 250 or below. It takes it up to 357. And so the workshop was a little hard to dialogue with, and so we didn't have a lot of opportunity to go back and forth. The legal counsel of the board recommended to the board that they not go back and forth. And so we didn't get a lot said there. I got five minutes in and a couple of other comments. 
and what we know is we have some certain st strategies we have issues with. Um, the cost of the nickel lease is burdensome if it goes into the rate wholly, and they can't pay for it. So, and, and new houses are providing significant income. I spent a lot of time this morning looking at that. The current taxable, the tax from the past has, has increased significantly. They're pulling in, or they're, they're taking in $23.9 million, I believe is the number, in tax-based debt service taxes. And so they're using that money to make one-year deals and stuff with entities like the City of Ventura, Casitas Municipal Water District. They spent two and a quarter million dollars last year. The problem is that state water project water, the Nickel Water is a private family lease, and so it can be funded with state water project debt service taxes. So subsequent to the past agency's meeting, I put on my thinking cap, and uh, I actually conceived an idea. I talked to Joe Zoba quite a bit about it. I shared the information I looked at with him. I think he supports the concept. I sent an email to, I've been pulling it together and pulled it together right at the end of the day today. I invited Jeff Davis and all the board members down here via email so they could at least hear the concept. We have a manager's meeting tomorrow. I've identified it. I want to run it out of the manager's meeting also. And so the concept is, so, so now let's go to the PowerPoint, and I'll explain it. The concept is there's a lot of taxes being, being collected, but so the first page is an introduction. The second page is I've just reviewed the March 11th agenda item and the five things, and so what I'm here tonight to do is talk to the board and the public about concepts for funding that are different than anything we've talked about. And, and it's a fairly simple concept, and other state water contractors are doing Valley Municipal, same thing the Valley Municipal Water District is doing it, and uh, others. And I made some calls to some state water contractors I know, and they said it was their belief that you could fund this concept and how I'm going to describe it, so I'll work through it all now. But uh, anyway, the, the big concept is we're collecting a substantial amount of taxes that are above what was anticipated because the assessed valuation is going up so much. And so, but we can't spend it on nickel. And so, it makes payment hard, right? And so, again, I have a graphic in color of what the past presented. And there's a couple of spikes above. So I, in red, I've identified sort of the 252 line. That's actually what the rate currently collects um, from the 2009 rate. And if you look at it, most of it, most of the water deliveries are below the rate, except for except for the uh, except for the two years where we had very low deliveries. I've said it before. There was you know it's a dollar per acre foot delivered, right? You have fixed cost and you have variable cost. The fixed cost remain fairly the same, and the variable diminishes. So you're funding a lot more of the fixed cost in a shorter delivery period. But anyway, I just kind of spelled that out. I actually gave the information. In 2014, we delivered 5,000 acre feet. And you can actually see the blue line <laughs> on the graph. And this is the passing of these numbers re represents water delivered. So the blue line represents water delivered. So you can see when low water delivered, the spike goes up and the cost goes up with it, right? And so it's fairly straightforward. And in 2015, we delivered 3,476 acre feet. And so, you know, what we need is solutions to get the job done. Um, and so that's what we're looking for. We hope, at least in the past, if you will give this a thought. I'm glad to see two of their board members in the audience. And so what I also did, just to give an idea, which parallels what the blue line represents, is tabulated actual water deliveries over time to the past. And what we see is we delivered more, much more water in 16, 17, and 18. 11,460 total, 15,837, and some change in 12,621. And uh, at, at the far right side, and then what came into the basin is the red column. And so the red column is what got delivered to Banning, Beaumont, Cherry Valley, and San Antonio Pass Water Agency over the course of the last 14 or 15 years. Yeah. <coughs> We talked to the same. Yeah, so so we have a deal for. All right. Well, we have the same color copy available yeah. for those who are interested in PDF or we just ran out of time for any. We're expecting to show it on the screen.
screen, so um, I'll hold it up and walk it over if you want to ask questions. But uh, the big thing is when you get to, so now I'm turning, so I'm leaving the calculation page, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, and I'm turning to the sales comparison page, which I previously identified. And when you look at it, you see we were positive for 17 and 18. And that is really where we started spending money. So what was what happened was the tax agency collected $22 an acre foot in a new water fee, which would allow it to be spent on, I've read the, the rate study, and, and the rate study would allow that to be spent on the nickel lease, the way it's worded. And they also created a rate stabilization, stabilization of $11 an acre foot. And so those things added to the coffers and they kept a running balance in their work. But when we started making expenditures on nickel, it, it depleted those funds and now they're struggling with a funding mechanism. Um, very straightforward. And what, we're, what we need is a solution on how to fund. And so what I'm going to say here in just a couple minutes is one idea for a funding solution that actually keeps the rate reasonable. And so, um, so I went through, I went through the uh, sales comparison, and what you really see is in any particular year, you got about 1.9 million dollars of nickel water, which is identified by the bounded area. That, depending on how much you sell, creates a burden. The less you sell, the more that number remains constant because you have to pay that. Money. And so you can kind of see the number both down and green on what the board is. Board has um, at the bottom, and what the acre feet cost is, and no nickel is in there. If you assume 330, I think it probably should be lower, but that's open for discussion as you move forward. But if you add nickel, it really creates a problem. It makes it what it does is it makes it so it's, it would be very hard for us to purchase extra water to bring in because it'll it'll break our piggy bank, so to speak. Again, <coughs> the concept. So I'm turning to the next page. The concept is to change the policy of the past agencies. They're already looking at abandoning their rate model and not collecting certain activities that are in the current rate, so they're looking at options. And so the, the basic concept is use the taxes which are growing because of the new houses and they're going into the bank and not being able to be spent on the nickel, but they are being spent on other water deals. Use that to take part of the operation, maintenance, power, and replacement costs, which is the variable cost, out of the rate and pay for it with taxes and move in the nickel water. So you're using the new growth taxes to pay for the part of the variable cost. And I've actually got the math worked out and show, show how it would work. And then move in the nickel. So you're funding the nickel in the rate, but you're basically swapping it out and the new houses are able to pay for it. And so I've looked at the tax base that's being, I went through all the audited financials for the past agency over the last 15 years. We worked through all that today. We looked at all their DWR charges other than a window of in 2015 to the end of 2016. And it looks like a concept that could work. And so the, and, and so the math, so, so uh, and on the next page, I sort of presented what the current rate for the 2009 3 resolution looks like. And so they collect $10 an acre foot for operational expenses. That's pay 50% of the salary of their operations manager, which is, um, and then $3.50 for administrative costs, which is like 5% of their overall cost. They move to that. And a passage fee from San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, the Yuba Water Purchase, which gets about 200 acre feet a year down here. The new water purchase stabilization, and, and rate stabilization is 22 and 11, mm -hmm. right here. And then the subtotal of those numbers, 58, 36, 317 is what we are charged. You have the Valley Water District a little bit less because they don't pump through. They're nine dollars less, I believe, so they pay 308. But they don't pump through Cherry Valley Pump Station, so they don't have to pay that energy cost. And so the pass-through fee, when you take 58, 36 off, 317 is 258.64. Okay. That's what the pass-through fee is. We saw on that previous slide that the bar, up till today, it's been mostly below 250, 252, whatever. 
And so, and so that's how their rate is currently set up. And then what I did next was I did some projections, and they're a little hard to read. But I'll, what I did was I looked at the next four years and what the retailers would like to order, most likely. And I talked to Joe Zoba in particular about it to get his support because he's the biggest orderer besides us. And with replenishment and drought proofing and everything, we'd like to be at 10, 7, 9, 50. 1120 and 11450 probably over the next few years, assuming a same similar growth pattern. And now we know there might be some changes to that. But the reason I'm setting this up is I'm going to show you a model on how moving some of this stuff into the rate could work and could create a funding solution. And so, so Yukaito right now would be able to be at 1150 for the next four years, and Fannie may be at 450 if the rate goes up. I think they may choose not to purchase. They may still choose not to purchase. And then if recycled water is available, I added that in because that would reduce our needs. It may or may not be by 2021, but that's where I plugged it in, 2021 and 2022. And so now, the next page, that's kind of the forecasting and projections to come up with the totals. In 2019, 12100 is the base order. In 2020, it would be 12350. In 2021, if recycle happened, it was 11700 and 11950. So, so now I broke down the past agency's rate structure, and the concept would be to move certain, a percentage of certain items out of that 2009 rate model and move it into tax based funding. And then the residual would be under rate-based funding. And so I'm going to explain what you're trying to do is divide down the rate to then put in the nickel. And so the idea is the, you, the rate could pay. So, we, we, so the final note is the region has lost 40% of state water project allocation due to the uncertainty, it's, you know, it's operating at 60% on average, so we've lost 40%. So the concept is we need to regain that 40%. And so in a rate-based funding, the existing people would help regain that with 40% of kind of an expenditure. And so 40%, so, we, so what we're doing is we're going to split the OMP and R and we're going to move out certain costs, and then we're going to be able to fund, I'll show how we, we could be able to fund the nickel in lieu of those costs. And so we're going to move 40%, we're going to take 40% of the $10 collected under the, the operational expenses, and we're going to put that in the rate, and we're going to put 60% or $6 in tax base because that's state water project operations. It could be done legally, I believe, and some people I contacted could. I looked at San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. Their financial structure shows that it looks like they do it. I talked to Joe Zoba, but he said that was his understanding, but he's never seen it perfectly documented. So it take, it take some looking at, but um, Joe Reichenberger used to be on a state water contractor's board. He said that's how they used to do it. He got off the board in 2012. So we had that validation yesterday also. I made mean, a call to a third state water contractor who said it was his opinion, and that's all it is, that you could pay for these things with that sort of stack. So, you, you do that on the first line item. The second one, which is the operations cost, you change that number so you're collecting 40% on the rate, 60% on a tax base funding. The pass through fee, you do the same thing with that state water project operations. Yuba, you do the same thing. I believe that state water project operations because it's part of its wheel through the contract. That, that's a little loose in my mind on can you do it or not. It's not a significant amount of money, it's about 40 five an acre foot or 54 an acre foot. You leave, if they so desire, the rate stabilization and the new water purchase 100% in the rate. So you're still collecting that. And so what you get to is you want to collect 40, you want to move in the rate 43, You're going to move 43, I'm not down at the bottom yet. You're going to move $43.14 into the rate, and you're going to move $15.22 in tax base. Mm -hmm. And then, then you go down to the pass-through, which is the power, O M 
with me, that the, the true OMPNR down at the bottom is the 258.64. You put 40% of that in the rate, and you put 60% in tax base funding. That's the concept. <coughs> per, at the bottom of this page, per the March 11th water rate discussion at the past, the required nickel funding for 2019 is $1.931 million. Once again, what we're really paying for state water project tax base and rate base is more like $2,100, $2,200 an acre foot. So if we can figure it's not, it's not that it's higher cost water, it's just really hurts you if you gotta put it all over. And so the concept is you let the new houses and the new growth that we've had, and I'll explain that in a little bit, pay what they're putting into the coffers to help supplement this. And so the new growth, I think currently the way it's been working adds about 300,000 to 350,000 a year in tax-based contributions to the PASS agency so on, on a basis of 500 homes. And so if you, in three years you're making a million dollars, in six years you're making two million dollars on tax-based contributions. And I've got some general math or a plot to show that. So then you get down to how does that work with the water order, and I've kind of shown the whole spreadsheet I built, but I'm going to flip to the next page because I zoom in on the bottom. But you have kind of the breakdown at the top, and then you flip to the next page right away, and it's a little easier to see. And so what I looked at was, okay, what if the past agency doesn't have 100% of the water to deliver that we want to order? If they have more, great. We're making, we're bringing water into the region, we're keeping the cost low. But what happens if they have less? How does that look? with the funding strategy against the nickel water. And so this chart shows you that if you, it runs out each year at the 4060 funding rate based on the water orders. The water orders are in this column, which is column three, right here. And so at 100%, we want 10, 100, 10, sorry, 12, 100, 12, 350, 11, 700 if we get recycled water, and 11, 950 we get recycled water. And so the rate-based funding provides 1.7, 1.8, 1.7, 1.7, and the tax base strategy is just a hair over 2 million on everything except one year, which is 2021. And so we're still able to pay for the 19 rate of nickel, but not by much. And if it accelerates, which I think it has an escalation on at 2%, it'd probably be balanced. Mm -hmm. but, but effectively, you're breaking even, or you're a little fat. And so so you, you put that in reserves, and then if you have a low water year, you don't have the water, you have those reserves potentially to help you get over the hump in the years where you can't deliver the order over time. So effectively, and then if you have an 80% year, it shows you run a little more in depth that you're a quarter million dollars in the, in the red. The nickel water funding variance is where that shows up. Um, the second to the last column from the right. And so that's kind of how it would pan out if you were to do something. <coughs> Finally, um, talking about what's happening, I have a graphic that came from the city of Beaumont, but it shows parcel count in the city just to show how many parcels have been added. And so those additions between even 2012 and 2018, there's some blue and some other colors, but the blue is residential. So the residential went from 11,800 or so parcels in 2011 up to about 13,800 parcels. And that's where that extra tax base is coming from that we're using to help do this heavy lifting. Um, I, think, I think when you work out the math at a little over 0.546 acre feet per dwelling unit, you can get about 3,100 homes out of the nickel usage on a long-term basis when you divide 1,700 by 0.546, it gets you 3,111 <coughs> homes or something like that. And so that 3,111 homes, when you actually work out kind of what the assessed valuation is today and what the past collects, actually funds that purchase during that, you know, when you get to the end of it, you're making a little over $2 million the way I do the math. And so it basically pays for itself. Um, and then, so, so the idea is the new homes are contributing significant taxes, I'm on the next page, sorry, and, which might be used for funding the past.
passing the has funded a one year purchase with the city of Ventura and Casitas using those taxes to the tune of $2.25 million. And they're currently considering taking $15 million or so as a maximum number, nothing's been decided, but they're looking at options to pay down some future reserve, future balloon payments. And you know, my thought is when the further growth comes, that's sort of at the end, mid and end of 2020, 2025, 2030, that period, let the people pay the taxes for that, that'll pay for that activity. And then use the, you know, the idea is to use the money to help the nickel water lease by paying part of the OMP and R, the variable cost. And so it's an idea. It just it is what it is. I think it's a good idea. Joe Zoa thought it was a good idea. Um, and it's something we could get behind and support, we believe, if the passage is interested in considering it. Um, I hope to report on this at the manager's meeting tomorrow with the water retailers. And so we finally, from our white paper, we have a projection of taxes, tax earnings, based on some projections we did. And the red line is sort of what the sand you're going to pass as debt service is coming up. And then when you get to 2035, those taxes fall off. And if you do get the site's reservoir and you do get Cal Water fixed, even as you stack those things up, it still fits well under the tax. And, and your potential tax at the current rate is significantly higher. It's on the order of $50 million if you leave the tax rate the same. And so um, at the end, the last slide I talked about, they're, they're, uh, this year they're putting $5 million in reserves unless they do some more water deals. Um, they have had some closed sessions and it looks, when you read what the closed session is about, that they might be looking at some things. Speculation on my part. But they're putting $5 million in reserves in 18 and 19, even with a $2.25 million one-year deal from Casitas and Ventura. And so the suggestion would be to have the pass agency review the option to use taxes to help pay the operation, maintenance, power, and, and replacement variable cost, and move the nickel into the rate. Basically swap one out, swap one in. But the idea is by subsidizing the variable cost, which is state water project stuff, and should be eligible, they'll have to consult with their legal counsel, but should be able, eligible for consideration would allow the new taxes being generated by the new homes to, to do the lifting on that cost. And so that's the concept. I um, appreciate everybody being here and listening. Um, and I will open it up to questions. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate that. Um, Director Williams, don't dare go down that path. Understandable. <laughs> Director Hoffman. I have two questions. Uh, number one is uh, tax based funding is based on property values remaining constant, is, which we don't know. If they, I mean, we've been going up, well, I think 6% this past year, give or take, depending on um, where it's located. And then I think things are slowing down. But, um, valuation, it doesn't take into account if property values go up, which that has been a trend over the last 30, 40, 50 years. So is that, is that true? Yeah, the, the trend from 2002 to 2018 here, other than there's been a bump and a little bit of a decline, but it's a straight line incline. And the other thing to note is we've already had the growth that's really that really could be used to help pay for the nickel. To put it in perspective, the tax agency, when I look at their financial statements, which they put out in July of this year, um, and what they just had at one of the recent finance and audit meetings, they're projecting $23.9 million in tax base um, revenues from debt service taxes only, not general fund. And they get a bond cover that comes back that bumps that up to about $27 million. And their expenditures this year are $22 million, including that $2.25 million purchase from Casitas and Ventura. And so there's a gap even right now of $5 million. I think that debt service on the state water project will probably come up because they have bond payments and stuff, and it'll close that gap to closer to zero. But And it'll actually go negative as you move into the late 2000s because they have some balloon payments that are due on the East Branch extension bonds. 
and that's what they're talking about prepaying. But if they have $15 million that they think could be used to do that, maybe that could be used to help kind of get us through this period as the valuation comes up um, to kind of move through that slot. But it looks like when I, I went through all their audited financials for the last 12 or 15 years this morning, at about 4 in the morning, and tabulated them all and looked at the growth over time, and I actually have all that data put together. And there's certainly been a significant increase in tax-based contributions, and the growth is paying a lot of taxes, and they're, they, they have to do some work in the future for site reservoir and Cal water fix, but it looks like there's some money available to get through this problem with, with um, the Naval water lease only because of the way it can be funded. Again, with the way the total cost of water is, I'm not saying it's a bad deal. What makes it a struggle is if you can't pay for that with taxes, you have to find a solution that you can pay for it with the rate and this solution is going to be So, one other question. Um, and, and if you don't have any comment, that's okay. Our legal counsel, based on what he's saying as far as mix, uh, switching around the way the funding takes place in this uh, explanation, is that something that you've had any experience with or do you have any comment on it is what I'm asking? To see what the flexibility was in the use of the tax revenues that tax agency has and other than what has to be allocated for bond service, I think they have a lot of flexibility and more or less experience of other districts shows that that happened. So, I, but I haven't looked at it specifically, and they have legal counsel over there advising them. No, I understand that. Yeah. But no, I thought the flexibility was there to do something like this. Thank you. The importance for talking about it is they give a direction to their general manager to look at a four hundred eight dollar an acre foot cost. That that makes us. We will have to discuss. Do we want to get our sixteen thousand foot acre foot order this year if it's available because it's. It's you know ninety dollars more than we're paying currently, and, and we've already taken two years out of reserves to buy water lots here. We want to keep doing it. It's just the strategy to keep it affordable is, is the key, you know. So we can do projected use. We can bring down more water. We don't have to rely on passing to pay water to do that out of reserves and uh, get the job done, you know. Dr. Slauson, the sixty forty concept. Um, Seemed a little strange. Seemed like accounting fidgetry to me at the beginning, but you say it's established. Other people have been doing it for a long time. The 60 40 concept it started as 40%. We've lost 40% of the state water project. And so you're doing state water project operations, and the rate, you really try to maintain a similar rate to what we're paying, what we're trying to do. It happens that 60 40 works. It just does. But, but the way to consider it is we've lost 40% of reliability, so we're picking it back up, so we leave that in the rate. And, and you don't want the rate so low that, you know, you want the rate to be kind of appropriate and allow the past agency to have some opportunity to do some savings and make some opportunities for the future for different things. And so the concept, just generally the number split works. The second half of it is, the lost 40% of reliability is something you could say is worth picking back up and bring here to help you do that as we bring the water source in. I like that strategy of trying to regain that 40%. Yeah. And yeah. so the nickel does that, it gets us up, it gets us a little farther down the road. Okay. So this would just require them to restructure some stuff on their end on their... On well, their there are, yes, they'll have to change the way they approach their rate, but they're already talking about doing that. Um, yeah. They're already talking about abandoning what they collected for rate stabilization stuff just to get through the next year or two, something that keeps them whole. And this is a strategy that might give them that opportunity. Is this the kind of uh, analysis that would uh, happen under any rate study? We're, we're planning on doing a rate study too, right? So um, The past agency on their rates, they want to do a nexus study to look at it. I've actually run all the numbers. I have a lot more information. Um, but I decided to. You didn't want to give us all of it? <laughs> right. Does the past so, so this is a policy decision for the past board. Yeah. Right. 
and I can say this because I represent a lot of um, systems that charge rates. And the temptation is charge the rates that you can charge legally, which means everything that recovers your total cost, and don't put another revenue source into that. So everything gets thrown on the rate payers that you can legally justify. Yeah. And this is a, a suggestion that we get the passport away from that particular process. If you ask for a rate study, that you're, the first thing you're going to find out is what these guys think you can charge on, as a maximum charge. Sure. I think, okay. I think the important thing to note is I, my observation is they're struggling with how to implement and stay whole. And, and because it's taken over a year to get here, it's obvious that there's not an easy solution to it. And there's been discussions of capacity fees and stuff like that. I think it's important to note that the taxes do not have to be raised to implement this, I don't believe. I've looked at it in enough detail that with the current taxes. You can't start to raise property taxes. That's, that's right. But I'm just telling you, okay. you know, we're already doing the lifting to get us there. It looks to me like they will have to vet it if they have interest in it. Um, certainly, I would be willing to. At the last workshop, their legal counsel suggested that they not dialogue back and forth. I, the boards, many members of the passage the board seem interested in having an open discourse. It is a workshop. Their legal counsel advised against it. They talked about restructuring it so that the next time we could dialogue back and forth. I hope to bring this to the manager's meeting tomorrow and move it on up the line and see if there's any interest. So that was my last question. What was the next step? Manager's meeting sounds like a good, good next right. step. <clears throat> Okay, Dan, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to item number 11, discussion regarding Bogart, Bogart. <laughs> board training with Beaumont Trail Valley Water Districts, Public Relations, Consultant, CB Strategies. Come on up. You're on. The mic doesn't work, so please try to speak up. No problem, I can project. I'm really good at that. Uh, hopefully I don't project how I'm feeling. Uh, so this was supposed to be a beautiful PowerPoint. There's lots of animation in it. There was video. It's all kind of been cut. So we're down to bare basics, which is not necessarily a bad thing in terms of communication. It really makes you stretch how you communicate and how you articulate what you're trying to say. Um, and I, based on the presentation that I just watched, there's going to be a lot to communicate and make it a little bit more simple and easily understood by more people. So getting back to the training or workshop, uh, I'd like to sort of get started. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Tara Bravo. I'm the Vice President of CV Strategies. I have worked for CV Strategies for about 10 years. So I have a lot of experience talking in front of boards just like yours. And I'm hoping that today we'll be able to scratch the surface of what communications training might look like. Um, I built out this training in four parts. So today we're gonna just go really high level. We're gonna keep it short. Um, I also have a series of additional trainings that we'll be going over. Um, we're gonna talk about your official capacity. So what that looks like in the community, what that looks like in the dais, what that looks like to the community, in the community and to the community. Then we're going to talk about effective presentations at a future point because I know that you guys are often presenting to the industry, you're presenting to the community, you're presenting at community meetings, um, and representing the Beaumont Cherry Valley District in a way that would make you proud. And then we'll talk about comprehensive communications where we really dig into um, making sure that you know exactly what's happening. You have, you'll have the ability to have that, the information at your fingertips and exactly how to say some things that may be tricky to explain to others and we'll get into communication styles at that point. So today's really just to talk about the importance of communication and how and when and where and why. So to start that off, the number one rule in communication is your relationship with your customer is determined by how you communicate with them. 
It's about transparency. It's about accountability. It's about making sure that what you're saying to the public is accurate. It's about making sure that you're representing the district and not necessarily your own views, but incorporating those in a way that represents the district. So remembering all the time that every person you're interacting with is a customer in some way, shape, or form. And through that theme, every interaction is a transaction. So you have the opportunity to protect the reputation of the district and the opportunity to compromise that. So every time you're in the grocery store and approached by somebody asked about what's happening with the rates, what's happening with recycled water, what's happening with something going on at the district, you want to be able to answer that in an effective manner. And in order to do that, you need to be prepared and ready to address those issues. Part of the process that I'm doing with staff right now is identifying those key things that we need to communicate and how we are going to communicate those going, going forward. So we're creating and crafting key messages so that way you guys know what's happening in a, in a way that's easy to communicate to others. And the idea behind that is that you have a diverse set of individuals that you're speaking to. Not everyone is of the same age, the same background, the same communication style. You might have someone who can only talk at you and not hear what you're saying. There are ways to communicate to those individuals as well. Usually it's through a leave behind because you're never going to be able to talk them into whatever you're trying to say. So it's those kinds of things and opportunities that we're looking for every time we're talking to someone. Um, and through that, the message should match the audience. So we're looking to, ask, to assess your demographics. We'll be doing that behind the scenes later on. And then uh, we'll be identifying different ways to speak to those individuals. We'll also be using different avenues for different stakeholder groups. So one stakeholder group might be a town hall meeting style. One stakeholder group might be mailed newsletters. One stakeholder group might be social media. It just depends on how they prefer to be communicated. You want to be where the people are, not make them come to you. It's fantastic that you have such great community members who have actually come in today to express how they're feeling, but for every person in the audience, there are thousands who will never actually enter those doors. So it's a lot about how to communicate to those individuals as well. So in that, we're going to be setting community expectations. Here's sort of the bad news. Special districts often do too good a job of making sure the water gets to the tap. Nobody really questions how that happens. Nobody goes, oh, I turned on my water today. Look at that. I should call the district. Thank them for making that happen. You don't get extra credit for doing that. You need to talk to them and explain to them what you're doing to maintain that system to ensure that they understand the nuance behind what you're doing. So the result of that is people take your services for granted, which is really difficult to overcome when you're talking about things like raising rates or getting them to change a behavior or um, addressing legislation that's coming up so, for example, AB 1668 is going to be really difficult to kind of communicate about, make people understand what's happening there. So it's really key to make sure that you're communicating constantly and all the time. So all the time, not just right now, right here. I'm really um, grateful and thankful that the staff has and the board has approved this communications outreach effort because that's how this is going to get to the community. And only you guys can control that, how, it, how they hear it, hopefully. Because if you don't tell your story, somebody else absolutely will. And because if they're not hearing from you regularly, they'll become disengaged. 
they'll become, they have no concept of cost drivers, they have no concept of what you're doing, they have no concept of how it requires somebody actually going to fix the pipe to make sure that it works. They have no idea that it takes a finance guy 15 hours to make sure that the rates match up. They have no idea of those kinds of things unless you tell them. Or they're just going to assume everything's fine, it's not as close great. Or they're going to assume that it's not. And that's the worst, that, that's the worst case scenario. They're assuming that things are not going well, that things are not going great, right, and you have the opportunity to tell them what's really happening, which makes them feel safe, protected, etc. One of the best ways to talk to them and make sure that they're not making their own assumptions is to do the ABCs. See, this is way better on the screen. To do the ABCs of communication, which is always be communicating. Now, it's about being proactive. It's not about listening to somebody say, I'm really upset, and then telling them why they shouldn't be upset, because you've already kind of lost their attention. It's about making sure that they understand before they walk in what's going to happen and what is happening. It's about being consistent so that what you're saying is not totally different than what you're saying versus what Dan's saying. It's about making sure that everyone's on the same page and we're all making sure that the story is accurate and that ratepayers are getting the information they need. It's knowing your community pulse. It's not just an outward effort, it's also about listening and really hearing what people are saying. So I know that sometimes those conversations can be uncomfortable, but if you listen to what they're saying, you're able to then create something that, create a message that might reach them and might help them understand what you are going through and the decisions you're having to make. You want to make sure that you're developing targeted outreach so that it hits every single person. You don't want to overlook a whole community of people because you didn't develop a vehicle for them. You also want to, uh, and don't be afraid of FaceTime. So sit down with someone, talk to them. If they have a concern, actually take the time. Your time is a valuable commodity and most people recognize that and appreciate when you offer them the information that they need. And finally, you know, this is like the scariest thing I'm going to say all day, seek public buy-in. Try to get to the heart of things and then listen and then explain and then evaluate what people are saying. So it, that's one of the most difficult things in terms of communication is actually allowing yourself to go, you know, I really want to hear what you're trying to say and I'm not just going to continue telling you the same thing I've been saying 15 times that you don't understand or hear. Um, and before I get to the next slide, we're gonna do a little interactive piece. I didn't wanna to get too interactive today because I know that we've got a lot of people and a limited amount of time. And, um, but I wanted to hear from you guys, and I don't know, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do an interactive piece? Or am I just presenting? We could just open it up for discussion by the director. Maybe I should finish then. I'll finish and then I'll open it up for discussion. All right. So finally, you want to get out there. At the end of the day, it's about the spokespeople, it's about the ambassadors, it's about you guys actually talking to the public and making sure that you're putting faces to names. So you want to participate in community events. You want to use pictures of you guys doing things in ways that lets people know what's happening. Make sure that you don't become just a nameless entity who makes sure that the tap turns on. And let the community in. Fostering this understanding will boost value. It'll allow you to tell your story again before somebody tells it to you. And the preventative outreach works to build and maintain confidence in the organization and in the board, which I think at the end of the day is really what I think we all want. We all want to have confidence in our board. I don't think anyone would say, oh, I don't, I don't care for that. I really want to be shaky. It's, it's those kinds of discussions and interactions that allow people to hear what you're trying to say. So, 
before I open it, the thing that I would love to hear in open discussion is your goals for the outreach for this upcoming year. What would you love to have people understand about the district in a way that is constructive and interesting? Thank you. Stand by right there. Standing. Director Williams, any comments? Uh, so many. Generally speaking. Generally, I think this is a great presentation. Um, and these, I guess, not tactics, but um, yeah, they were great. Um, I've, we've employed those before when I worked with the school district and, and trying to get the, the goals out to parents and everybody else. The stakeholders, it, it's very important in making them feel like they're part of it so they buy into it. Very important. Thank you. Aside from what is on our web page, and, and maybe you have or have not uh, at this point been a part of that, um, the district um, at least a year ago really did a great revamp of our of our um, kind of our outreach. If you were to come onto our web page, but aside from that, my one of my questions is: is you've all, you you obviously have likely seen that you've talked and met with staff. Um, I would be, I would like to hear maybe what the strategy is to reach out to some of our customers that may not normally be browsing our web page. In other words, are we going to consider like an e-list where in the event that we have this breaking news or whatever the case may be that that, that stuff just goes out to a you know a, a much broader list. Um, so that that's one of the questions that I have. And then um, second would be you know what is the um, you you're right. What what do we want in the next say 12 months to be put out there? And I would say we first of all we have a lot of catch up to do. We have a lot of um, um, projects that are in different various stages um, that are going on within the districts. Most of which the public would know about unless they attended these meetings or they went on our web page and they read our minutes and, and that sort. So. Um, you know, I'd like to know how, how the public would be made available uh, that information, especially if one of these projects are going right through their neighborhood, right? Or we're building a reservoir right next to your house, and then you say, wow, I never heard of that. You know, so, so, so those are some of the nuances that I see that we certainly need to improve on. Not sure how we're going to get there. I know you guys will work it out. I don't remember your exact scope of work, um, but it would be something that I would go back to look, go back and take a look at. Um, and I think kind of the last to follow up on my end is, um, you know, how do we see um, the district evolving with regards to communication? In other words, what, what, what groups are we trying to target? Is it just public agencies? Is it the general public themselves? Is it both? Is it uh, anything on the state level? Any state agencies? Anything of that sort? So those are some of the, just the... the you know, the things that I'm, that I'm thinking about. Do you want me to? Go ahead and answer. Okay, you so a couple things. One is I don't want to speak out of turn because I know we've talked about some potential vehicles for um, Beaumont, Cherry Valley Water District, one of which is a newsletter. I think that's crucial to keep people just updated regularly. Um, we'd like to send it out electronically and then have printed copies available because of the um, cost associated with mailing something to every resident. However, when it comes to um, the annual consumer confidence report, I'd like I'd like to do this. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Um, I'd like to turn that into more of a newsletter format. It's something that you're going to be mailing to at least a postcard, so you might as well just do a little bit more investment there and. Make sure that everyone gets something in the mail that instructs them about what you're doing to communicate and where they can find information. I'd also like to increase your social media. I know you have a Facebook page. It's, you do, it's not, don't, don't bother going there. <laughs> it exists, it's just not, it, it needs to be an area where people feel like they can find information and that you guys know what's happening more than anyone else about what's happening with the district. Does that include like, face, you always hear Facebook, Twitter, blah, so, blah, blah, which I'm not, I, don't, I try to stay off of. But. Yeah, so 
Oftentimes for special districts, I advise them to do Facebook because it allows you to have a longer conversation. Mm -hmm. Twitter is so fast and fleeting that unless it's just about a water main break and don't go down this street, it tends to be a less effective method of communication for public agencies. Cities are great examples of where Twitter is incredibly useful. It's like, head down to the thing right now. There's always something happening. Okay. Um, now, when you talk about targeted stakeholder groups, I think that there are many, many groups that we need to be communicating with and have the same conversation with, but in a different, um, in a different forum and using a different message. So I think it's absolutely crucial that you're communicating with the industry. I think that how you communicate with the industry should be different than how you're communicating with residents. And I believe that there is absolutely a place and time for you to have a legislative document that explains what this district is, how it functions, what the important components of this district are, and create a profile so that way when you're seeking grant funding, when you're looking to um, create a new project where you're trying to help garner buy-in from legislative branches, you have something at your fingertips that is not written for a resident because they're a very, very different audience. Now, when I'm speaking of your local stakeholder groups, I'm talking about your HOAs, which are a different group than maybe your um, apartment complexes. They have very different needs and very different understandings of what's happening. For example, if you send an outdoor water rebate application to an apartment complex, they're not going to care. <laughs> What would be great to send to them if you're trying to uh, talk about water conservation would be indoor items. I know nobody uses water inside ever, but it's an important component to understand the difference between those audiences and make sure that what you're creating matches that. Now, we have a strategy set up in place that we've been working on to make sure that what we do reaches everyone, but those are the two three things, I think I've said three things, that are critical to start as soon as possible. Especially since the CCRs do, like, pretty soon. Thank you. And Director Hoffman, any, any comments? Yeah, just uh, <coughs> a couple of comments. Uh, I think the identifying the vehicle, again, which we mentioned already, is extremely important. I think different vehicles uh, reach different demographics of people. And, um, I know that, for example, in, in my uh, demographic, which is uh, uh, older folks, uh, we probably still get our bills in the mail. When we go to the younger folks, they're going to be uh, paying online or have automatic payment done. Uh, I could get a newsletter if one were produced in the mail, which would get delivered to me, but it wouldn't get to the other group. Uh, email is another possible thing. I know, and I know you know all these things, so I don't need to tell you anything. But those are the things that I'm looking for: is how they would reach them. Uh, you know, I, I I get I don't know 40, 50 new emails every day, and I already know which ones I'm not even going to open. So uh, you know, that's all part of the way everybody evaluates their time. So, and what we communicate, I think, would be important to possibly be able to communicate highlights of things that are occurring and things that would be of interest to the people that we're serving in such a way that they can uh, understand it in a sh short, uh, brief message, but at the same time can make them feel like they're involved. That's it. Thank you. Director Slauson? Well, you uh, wanted to know what we were expecting or wanted the message to get out. Um, in my opinion, in my experience, Anyone who wants to know has already found out. The people that are in the, in, the, in the room tonight are very active. They know exactly what's going on, sometimes before I do. When it's going to be important is when people get angry. And I see, I assume we're going to have to have some community meetings. Um, I feel that's where most of the value of this outreach is going to happen. And, uh, are you going to help out there? I am, and that is part of the scope of work. What I do want to mention is that oftentimes um, 
if that is the only time you communicate with people, that is when you start to get a lot of mistrust and miscommunication. If you are known for communicating regularly, even if they're not necessarily engaging with every message, when the community meeting happens, they understand that they've heard from their water district before, they probably should have paid attention, but maybe didn't. And this isn't a total shock, like, oh my gosh, what is happening? The sky is falling. Let me revise. When they get angry, I do want them to be able to Google it, look on our website and find it, um, and then come to the community meeting. So yeah, uh, caveat, all the, all the other stuff first also. But yeah, when the rubber hits the road, we're going to need to really communicate face to face. And it's going to be important. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give you guys that four-step training so that way you're ready for that interaction because I've seen my fair share of rate hearings go sideways. <laughs> is, our, is generally speaking the stakeholder list, is that just really generated based on our billing customers at the end of the day? Well, In your so, experience with special districts. So how I usually break out stakeholder lists is First of all, there's internal and external stakeholders. So I consider the board a stakeholder group. I consider staff a stakeholder group. And oftentimes, um, in larger districts, I'll even break out the staff into field service and customer service, because those are also people who have completely different interactions with customers. Because your field guy needs to know what's happening just as much as your customer service person does, just as much as the people actually making the decisions. Because those are the people that actually keep you with your customers was, more was, I wasn't going to ask the question, but it was one of my concerns is that, you know, obviously you want to engage the, the public, you want to engage the customers, you want to somewhat train the public exactly. and the customers, but at the same time, that same training to some level has to be done in-house so our staff can, it is fully, fully understands, you know, the, the core elements that are going on. You and know, it's again, because obviously if not all of our staff comes to these board meetings, so unless items are discussed in a separate staff meeting, you know, especially the folks that cover the front desk that interact directly with the public, the field uh, staff that interacts with the customer service representatives, let me just say generally speaking, yeah, they're surely going to have to be in the queue on a lot of this stuff. And <coughs> it's something that is often overlooked, oftentimes customer service is the last to know and then they get a call and then they have a completely different answer than everyone who's been in the training or is aware of what's happening. Or, or maybe, you know, that newsletter is going to go a long ways. Exactly. It really is and it's going to obviously tell people, hey, if you want more information, click here. But at the same time, hopefully you guys are having some level of discussion by which, you know, maybe uh, maybe there's a, it's a recommendation that that we have these just like what trifold little flyers that if, if one of the one of the field staff goes to somebody's house and for whatever the, whatever the customer um, call might be, <clears throat> you know, the field staff can say, hey, by the way, here's this flyer. We do a great. This is our public relations. It's a way to, to find out what's going on with the district. This is a public relations flyer to bridge the gap and to, to get the stakeholder or the customer to engage. And of course, you always want their contact information at least by email because at some point you got to build a list, right? Absolutely, and so kind of getting back to your original question, which is about stakeholder groups. So there's internal and external, and then when you talk about external, you're talking about legislation, industry, right. key players, key, so regional players, um, and then your public, and then you divide right. up your public by demographic. Right. Yeah, that stakeholder group is a very broad. That's why I was asking what, what level of engagement would it be with local governments, state governments, you know, I'm just making sure yeah, that they're all Yeah, you've got your regional players, then you've got the industry, and you've got yeah, the... Yeah, and the industry. Can, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, okay. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, one other question. Yeah. Is there going to be um, a way, maybe, um, for people to opt in to, like, a text message plus? Like, we have a special meeting at this time type of thing where they can opt in? So, that wasn't part of our original scope. That is... Uh, so there's a couple ways to sort of handle that. One is through an app. That's a really easy way to make sure that people, because that will do what's called a push notification. Mm -hmm. um, and there are companies that do those specifically for special districts and public agencies, but it's not an inexpensive thing to do. The text message, basically it's like a robo-text. Right. Um, 
those are less expensive, but not, they're not that inexpensive. And for me, I haven't, unless you're talking about reverse 911, which is there's an emergency, please make sure that you exit left, stay, exit stage right. Um, I haven't found that to be an incredibly useful tool. Some people really do like to communicate via text, but I've always found that if you're really gonna go the technological route, the app has been more successful in terms of reaching people because they have, it becomes a two-way communication with them instead of stop if you don't want to receive these anymore. Right. And then lots of people just go stop. Real quick on that, not to use the <coughs> Facebook groups geared much towards what you're referring to. I've heard people refer to Facebook groups and marketing schemes and they can target exactly who they want and when they want. But Facebook, if we build up the, the page, they can opt in and then be notified every time. Might be. That's, so if you like the page, you'll get most of the information. We can also boost specific, really important um, informational moments in terms of Facebook groups. So the way I talk about communication and the way you'll always hear me talk about communication is that it's an educational experience. It's not a let's get them where they live kind of marketing. It's not, that's not how I feel like public agencies should engage with the public necessarily. Um, those, there are definitely those tactics, but if you establish yourself as an expert in what's happening, people will come to you for the information. Now, that being said, if there is a Facebook group, you may want to create, or you may want to uh, have a staff member who is the spokesperson for the district who can then comment and answer questions there. And that's how you would engage with that Facebook group rather than having like a robo thing. I feel like that makes the communication with the district less authentic and therefore it starts to feel less credible. But that's like my personal <laughs> professional opinion. <laughs> Any further questions by the board? Hearing none, we want to thank you for thank coming you. this evening and uh, sharing your evening with us <clears throat> and uh, bringing this great PowerPoint and, and really help, really engaging and kind of help the board <clears throat> get a better idea of kind of what we're looking at. And, and of course, our feedback, I hope, was helpful. <clears throat> Absolutely, it was incredibly helpful. And thank you so much for having me here tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, one, one last thing, Tara. Um, sorry. One of the things we didn't really discuss as Felicia outreach is, is, uh, <laughs> is uh, I did that for you. <laughs> um, I hope I projected enough. Yes. One, one of the places to outreach some need for contact anyway with recycled water potentially is the HOAs and there's a significant number of them here. You know, and, and having our newsletters we could go over and contact them regarding recycled water at the same time. Hey, can we leave a stack of these here and your constituents or your residents can pick that up. Um, we didn't talk about it, but there's another vehicle. We, we have a significant amount of community centers now and things of that nature. And, and so there's places that if we were positive in our outlook and reached out with them. Hopefully, they would join us as the state. That would be part of the community meetings, I yeah. think. That's right. We just get to meet with them and say, hey, we got some newsletters. Mind you, leave a few here so your residents can see them. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I just want to throw that in. Just, just, there are some vehicles out there. Our, our senior engineer was actually president of an HOA here in Berkeley, so he's uh, been involved so in that. Great. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Have a good evening. Look forward to seeing you again for the next update. Yep. Hope that's in your scope. <laughs> I hope I have a working PowerPoint. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, there it is. Okay, let's move on. We're going to switch back to the agenda. We're going to jump back to item number seven. <coughs> Excuse me. Consideration of support of SB 669, Cabarello Water Quality Safe Drinking Water Fund, which would establish the fund in the state treasury and provide the monies, sorry, fund in the state treasury and provide that monies are continuously appropriated to the State Water Resources Control Board. This item is located on page 66 of the agenda. And that, Yolanda? I, I can take it, I think. I, I think 
the long and the short of it is there's been some uh, discussion of having a tax, mm-hmm. and it's been resisted by the water districts. And so currently there's a, a revised agenda to basically fund a water provision for disadvantaged communities and, and entities using the general fund. And so I think that's basically what this is, is a different take on how to fund an opportunity to help service those disadvantaged communities in the small districts that can't make the road hit the road, so to speak. And so um, the idea is we've been approached by the Association of California Water Agencies and asked us to execute a letter basically forwarding support for what our feelings are. And so um, I don't know if you want to have anything to add, but I will stop there. Let's open it up for comments by the directors. Director Williams. Thank you. Director Hoffman. Um, No comment right now. And Director Slauson. I'm not liking this governor of ours very much. No comment. Okay, so uh, I absolutely understand what this is. Um, it is the it is currently the best path forward, unfortunately, I guess you might say. So um, I think it would be a good idea, at least for at this point, for Beaumont Cherry Valley to support Aqua on this endeavor, and. Um, and uh, go ahead and execute the letter and uh, move it up the chain. So um, with that being said, do we have a motion to approve and execute the letter and forward to the Association of California Water Agencies and designated elected officials as identified in the staff report? So moved. Go ahead. I'll second. We have a first by Director Slauson and a second by Director Williams. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. Hearing, hearing okay, uh, Director Hoffman is opposed. Motion carries three to one. Sorry, I'm taking notes here. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Item, item number eight, consideration of award of bid for the purchase of three fleet vehicles in the amount of $80,197.32, located on page 82. Right. And I'll turn this over to staff. All right, well, I think our assistant director of operations, James Dean, is going to report on this. Um, we've talked about some of these trucks already, so I'll turn it over to James then. All right, President Covington, members of the board, thank you for your time. Uh, I've been accused in the past of speaking too quietly, so if you need me to, I'll speak up. I'll try and project. So what we have here is uh, at the February uh, 28th meeting, the engineering workshop, we surplused a number of vehicles and, and some other items there. Uh, the board approved surplusing those items. Um, some of those trucks um, need to be replaced so we can get the fleet up to where we need it to be um, with the staff that we have. We've had a few years where, where we've been short on trucks, and uh, for example, our production staff has four uh, production operators, but there's currently only two trucks that are all to the production department. So we're kind of sharing trucks um, as needed with um, the distribution folks and kind of shuffling people around to, to get some uh, trucks on the road and get people where they need it. They need to be there to do their work. So, what we're looking for here is to replace uh, three of the trucks that had significant uh, work needed to get them up and back on the road. All of them had high mileage, all of them are older trucks, as you can see 2004, 2008, 2005. Um, all of them in excess of 140,000 miles. Um, they, they've been on the streets, they've been up in the canyons, they've been working really, really hard. So, there's a significant work that needs to be done to those trucks to get them serviceable. So they've reached the end of their service life. What we'd like to do is replace those and kind of go through a, a different way of uh, trying to get more out of the trucks instead of just riding them until, they, until they're completely destroyed. So what we would like to do here is <clears throat> replace one of the uh, production trucks that was, 
that's one of them that was surplus this, this year. Um, that truck is, you know, needs a new engine and the fuel converter. That's one of the F two fifties, four wheel drive. Uh, we'd like to purchase that one and get it issued to the production staff so they can have another truck there. And then um, one of the four Rangers was traditionally used as meter reading and we used for small duty meter change outs, small activities like that. Uh, they don't make the uh, Ford Ranger anymore, so we wanted to replace that with the F-150. Which I recently heard that uh, there's, they may have brought the Ranger back out. For the Ranger's coming back. <laughs> um, I, I wasn't sure about that or not. But an F-150 would actually assist us a little bit better in that activity. What we'd like to do with that truck is to put it into rotation with our customer service. Representative that's on the field, he's not, he drives a lot in that truck, stop and go all day long, every single day, and take the truck that he was issued last year and cycle that one into the production department as well, so the, like, the supervisor could have some wells there. We, there's been a couple of uh, times where he's had to go out into the field and drive his own personal truck out to a job site to try and meet with some of his staff. So I'd like to get him uh, a truck. I think um, he drives a lot less than the customer service guy, so he move the, the new truck and the customer service, push that truck down to the production supervisor and give him um, some transportation that will work out well. And then the first truck there is to replace the one that was uh, lost in, for the distribution staff. <coughs> so if there's any, uh, we did go out to, um, as the policy says, the state contractor, downtown board. Well, we did reach out to them and meet their uh, Quote is included in the table on page uh, 83. They, all the, the total quote amounts were relatively close, uh, uh, except for race for the quote is less than that amount of money, and then everybody else. But uh, the lowest responsive uh, bidder on these, or the quote that we got rather, is from Fritz Ford, and we, we can reach out to some local uh, dealers as well as the state contractor, okay. which is like exactly that. But we did do that uh, just to be within the policy. So the uh, the lowest quote that we had here is also one of the um, shortest lead times in the truck, so the recommendations are for its board. If there's any questions, I will answer. So two F-250s by my calculations and one F-150? Correct. Gas engines? Correct. Yeah. All right, um, Director Williams? Yeah, Pardon me? Oh, was that? Yeah. Hey, yeah. perfect. <laughs> Director Hoffman. Uh, question I have, and I admit I didn't read each detail on each truck. Are they quoting apples and apples here, or are there slight variations? On the trucks they are, we send out the same request to every single one of the dealers so that they have the same information to quote on and they quote for So are they, are they uh, quoting from uh, stock on hand, or are these going to be ordered trucks? They're going to be ordered, yeah. They will be ordered? Yes. And um, I'm sure. We were strict down, so they're not. Uh, the funding, funding for this will come from capital replacement reserve? Yes. Yes, it was actually in CIP that was uh, approved in December for 2019. Uh, CIP, this is something that we've seen that was coming and something that we uh, anticipated and funded in that uh, CIP project. Okay, aside from uh, how the, well, it has to do with how the vehicle is equipped, but what do you feel are the uh, key factors as far as when you make a decision of what kind of vehicle you want to buy? I know you're going to tell me that based on what it's going to be used for, but how, how do you make that determination in relation to uh, a lot of the variables as far as uh, safety, what it's going to be used for, uh, residual value perhaps after it's uh, been uh, used up, uh, what the cost of service is going to be? Are we? Uh, is that pretty much? Doesn't make much difference on those things, or as far as I know, we go with Ford all the time. I'm not suggesting anything else at this time, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, we, we take all those things into consideration, and we kind of look at what the vehicle is going to be used for, what the need is within the organization. Are they going to be towing something? Is it going to be used primarily up in the canyon? Are they going to need four-wheel drive when it gets rainy and sloppy up there, and there's potential for them to get stuck? Um, Four-wheel drive is obviously something that they're going to need up there. The F-250 over the F-150, whether it's something that's going to be used, that, that needs to be towing compressors, towing potentially one of the, the trailers for spoils and that kind of thing. Um, we look at the crew trucks when they go in, whether they're going to need a lumber rack or something where they can transport um, material to and from job sites. So 
we consider what the, what the truck is going to be used for and then uh, kind of design it based on, on the needs for that activity. So, uh, and this is another just question about equipment. I'm assuming we don't need, but maybe they only come with power windows and power door locks and so forth and or radio. Is, are we getting radios with them? And if so, why do we need a radio uh, in the truck? Those kinds of things, that's one why it's a special order. They come with manual windows. They come only with AM, FM radio. Um, that's kind of the, as stripped down as you can possibly right. get. So that, that's why it's a special order. It's not straight off of the lot. It's not something that they carry because it's, some, it's something that we, we special order. In there. And they're all pickup trucks, of course, so we're going to be carrying stuff in them. We could have the option, maybe you already do think about it, of either a... Um, a bed liner that's either sprayed in or set in the truck for protection for the bed. Is that something that we... Yeah, we generally do that as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Director Slauson? Um, one, Just one uh, question. Uh, generally speaking, you are buying the XL model, so that's a stripped-down model. Correct. I'm not necessarily saying that that's what you should. I mean, at some point you may need an XLT, whatever. But... Have you taken any opportunity to compare the prices with like a Chevrolet yeah. vehicle of the same um, spec, so to speak, or are you strictly going with Ford? Because uh, most of the bids that have came back before this board have always been Fords. I'm not suggesting anything different because I have two myself. But I'm just saying, <clears throat> are you looking? I mean, are you looking at what the cost is for a Chevrolet model versus a Ford, and then if that what that cost is, and then if that cost is lower on one of those models, that's where you go out to solicit your other de your dealers to bring back your three responsible bids. Right. We did that uh, a few years ago, and the Fords were the, the cheaper truck within those classes. Um, so we've traditionally just been going after looking at the Fords, but it's something that we could revisit if. One, one thing to consider, because I just bought a new truck, is um, and it's being, it's, it's of course had to be ordered, but at that time when I purchased a vehicle, which was in January, um, Chevrolet actually had better incentives than Ford did, so I traditionally have all Fords, but um, I got talked into buying a Chevrolet, so that's just something to keep in mind to uh, you know browse the market, see who, saw, who offers the best incentives. And then, you know, um, I don't think anybody cares at the end of the day, especially the employee, what kind of vehicle, whether it's a Ford, Chevy, Toyota, whatever the case may be. Um, but I would suggest that, you, that we're looking for those incentives and those cost savings. Right. Dan, you have a, a comment? I was just going to say, um, and I haven't delved into it to see what the other vendors are, but our policy requires us to go to the California, state California vehicle vehicle procurement program vendor who is downtown board. And I don't know if they have... I just but that, have doesn't, that doesn't preclude you throwing three more prices in from a Chevrolet to be able to fifty. You I can still include it for it. What we would be doing is we'd be bidding, we'd be looking at prices for downtown board as one item, and then Chevrolet, I'm not saying that's not something we could do, certainly. I'm just saying, when you go to a Ford to try and match it with something that... That's a policy change. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to throw it out there. Yeah. Thank you. One, one more comment. Thank Director Hoff. And it looks like you've got all gasoline engines quoted, and, and I lean towards that because we don't need the longevity of the diesel with the mileage that we do. Right. And then another just comment, just to throw it out. You know, I, when I get new trucks, I, especially if they're going to be worked in, you can reasonably purchase uh, replacement uh, seat covers that go over the existing seat covers that help protect them from stains and wear and tear. So when those are worn out, you just replace them. Because that's, that's, you get in and out of the trucks a lot, breaks it down uh, on the seat. Okay. It's the same questions I feel when I'm standing over there in front of my board when I want to buy a vehicle. So that in mind. All right, so any other, no other discussions? Director no. Slauson, Director Williams. Um, so do we have a motion to approve uh, the purchase of three fleet vehicles? Um, from Fritz Ford in the amount of $80,197.32 as presented. I move that we approve the purchase of those three vehicles as uh, presented. Okay. I'll second. We have a motion by Director Hoffman and a second by Director Slauson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries pro. Thanks for the information and especially the uh, level of detail on the staff report. I appreciate that. Okay, so that takes us to uh, item number 12.
Um, I'll, I'll go for it, opposed to tabling it. Um, any ad hoc committee reports? I, I have. Well, we went to the, uh, the reclaimed water meeting yesterday. Everything's going well. Uh, everyone's fine uh, tuning the MOU. And that's all I have to report. Was there. What, what about the MOU? Uh, they're fine tuning the MOU. Oh. Uh, there's um, only one minor disagreement on um, meters versus volume uh, as far as. Um, Quantifying the numbers. Okay. That's the only hiccup so far that I can see. And Hop, Director, Director Hop, Hop. Yeah, I was just going to yeah, ditto that, and I feel that uh, I feel cooperation is well going well between the city and our district as far as the communication is concerned, trying to support each other and come up with mutually agreeable solutions that benefit all of the uh, uh, ratepayers, and we're not looking just for our own particular uh, concerns or needs. And I think if, as we satisfy the rate payers, I think we'll both be satisfied. So I, and I just feel, just from what I am able to see, I feel we're making progress. And uh, a lot of the things are, are new to me, I'll, under, I'll admit that, and I'm learning, but it, uh, we never get too old to learn. So, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's been a good experience so far. Okay. And I think that's, that's it? it. Yeah. Nothing from Boba, right? I don't see it on the list, so. No. Okay, um, general manager report. Certainly, I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet, believe it or not. Um, we're back online at the No Creek Recharge Facility. We did a lot of work to uh, get that back online, got our meters back in place when they were out. The back agency made a temporary connection to bring water. It's important to do that to get, keep exposure from losing water out of San Luis Reservoir, we may lose some anyway, or they may, but we're doing all we can to help that out. A um, couple other things, probably of most importance is the ponds are currently on, we have water in three and four at 20 CFS, so the capacity, it's a maintenance capacity, it looks like it's um, up again. And then I want to report quickly on well 21 and booster 21A. The motors have been delivered to the sites, they're both on the pumping units. The Damaged connectors were replaced. Well 21A booster is currently up and running. We have a premium efficiency motor on it. And it turns out um, when they adjusted the lateral of the pump is what I believe. It went from 1,400 gallons a minute production to about 1,800 gallons a minute production. So everything being equal, maybe we picked up quite a bit more efficiency. When you set the lateral of the pump, if it gets leakage by the bowls, you lose efficiency. So we may actually be saving the money we spent to do those upgrades over the course of the next year or two. And 21 is uh, flushing, or pending flushing, and waiting back here, lot of samples, but hopefully we'll be back online shortly. And then well 22, we haven't talked about that in a while, but that's in place. I went out with one of our staff members actually did a little bit of site grading, staking. The site's been graded to that. Um, based on the discussion we had before, we don't think paving is the best option because it requires some some uh, water quality activities that we don't necessarily want to do at the moment at that site. Um, because it's a sanding well, we think we might relocate facilities. And so we would probably reconfigure the site in the fairly near future. And uh, we're moving forward with that. And that being said, I'm going to stop there. All right, thank you. Let's move on to um, item number C, director's reports. Um, Director Williams, anything? Nothing to report. Director Hoffman? Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, I attended the uh, past agency rate study meeting on uh, Monday, and uh, we invited uh, members of their board to attend. And uh, If I get your name wrong, I apologize, but uh, Director Leah Tonin has <laughs> been here for the whole meeting, and I wanted to recognize him, and I wanted to thank you for coming, and I hope we, we you know, not bored you. Uh, and brother, uh, Dr. Ball was here for a good share of the meeting. Uh, Councilman White was here, who was on the two-by-two two committee, and our uh, our mayor attended the two-by-two two ad hoc committee for recycled water as well. And one of the things that uh, I learned at the past meeting is that uh, they're building the recharge ponds 
in the hope of uh, being able to capture and save all of the water that could or may become available. But their intention is, as I understood it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that they will only recharge water that nobody else of their, uh, in the service area chooses to purchase. Is, is that basically what I understood? I, I think they're working on a policy for okay, so that's not activity and how to utilize their storage account to sell right. water. Right. So they're not going to take water away from us to put in their recharge facility. We're going to have or could have first option in most cases and they're working on that policy. And I thought that was a good well, I, a good way to go. I think their current policy in the settlement with the Water Master Board requires them to offer to the retailers first and the retailers right. don't want it then they take it in. And I, and, and I like that. that. Well, it is the concept, and I like that. So that's that's good. And that's all I have. Thank you, Director Hoffman. Director Slauson, anything to report? I have to report that I missed the um, alliance meeting last week, last month. Uh, unfortunately, I had a plumbing emergency at my house, but I uh, heard from Dan Jaggers that basically the only discussion was rates again, and there's no <coughs> conclusion there. Okay. Thank you. And let's move on to 12D legal counsel report. Uh, my only short report is I attended the water master meeting, the last water master meeting, raised some issues in reference to the, their purported conversion or transfer of water uh, to the type of, uh, from developers before the water actually is needed to be served uh, on an actual physical project. And we raised some questions about that and we'll talk more about it later. Okay, thank you, James. Let's move on to item number 13, announcements. Personnel committee will meet March 25th at 5.30 p.m. Next engineering workshop is March 28th at 6 p.m. Uh, the next Beaumont Basin Water Master Committee meeting is March 27th, 10 a.m. That will be located here in our boardroom. Finance and Audit Committee, April 4th, 3 p.m. The next regularly scheduled board meeting, April 10th at 6 p.m., the next collaborative agency committee meeting will be May 1st at 5 p.m. And that takes us to item number 14, which is water supply for Beaumont Cherry Valley Water District and the region, which some of which was discussed tonight. And then we will adjourn at 8.03 to close session, uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D1. Uh, I don't know how much they need to cost, you know, but um, I would be willing to donate $100 for the radio for the trust. For the truck? That's awful kind, but I have to tell you, they come, they just, you can't, you really can't buy them without them. I'm, I'm involved in earthquake preparedness and oh, stuff like oh, okay. that, and I think they should be able to have them. They, they come, you can't get them without them anymore. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm, so surprised, I'm, I'm, surprised, I'm surprised you can still get crank windows, <laughs> but you can if you want it. But the radios, yeah. I appreciate crank windows, but I have to start paying the price of the motor to replace it. Being open session at 8.51 p.m., um, there's no reportable action from closed session, and we will adjourn the meeting at 8.52 p.m. Thank you.